Uh, please open your Bibles with me uh, and turn to Psalm 118. Psalm 118. And then uh, hold your place there. Put one finger there and then also turn to Exodus 15. So Psalm 118 and Exodus 15. And just be ready to look at both of those passages as we get started this morning uh, before we'll devote our attention more closely to Psalm 118. Uh, a few years ago, a certain car company developed an ad campaign to promote the reliability of their new vehicles. For their commercials, they brought a group of uh, four or five real people, quote, real people, as if they were fake people, but they were real people. They brought them together uh, who were regular customers of Ford, of Honda, and Toyota, people who favored those brands. And they set off in the distance in this big room four vehicles, probably a car, truck, two SUVs maybe, and they put these big sheets, these covers over them with those other logos, the Ford or the Toyota or the Honda, but only one at a time for the different groups of people. So if they were all Ford fans, they were all Ford coverings. If they were all Toyota fans, they were all Toyota logos, okay? And so it's kind of like a shock factor that, that you would ever see another car company's logo in this car company's commercial. Does that make sense? And then this guy, who is the spokesperson, he asks them, these real people, to affirm their love for their brand. He asks them which brand they think is the most reliable. And shockingly, they all say the brand name that we see covering all those cars in the distance, right? Then, though, to everyone's amazement, <laughs> the covers come off of those cars, and there are these other cars from this other brand. Let's just say the brand name may or may not rhyme with creme brulee, okay? It was, it was definitely a different approach. It got people's attention. That shock factor worked. It worked. It caused a stir. If you think about it, it's kind of sad, actually, that they, they thought people would be shocked that their cars were not the most reliable, uh, but that's what it was. And, and I'm not really aware of any mass hatred or, or bad reputation that Chevy has. They're good cars, as far as I know. But, but all that to say, unfortunately, the testing, uh, the testing that they had, that they got back, and the data, it wasn't as reliable as they had believed. Therefore, neither were their cars <laughs> that year. As it turned out, some of those other brands actually were more reliable than Chevy that year. So it's a bit of a blunder for their marketing team. They'd put all this money into these ads, they had to pull all of them, they just spent all that money on, uh, they'd been gaining so much steam because they were proven to be false. They were proven to be false. So talk about an advertisement backfiring. It backfired. Now, they recovered, of course, though. And for the record, I'm sure Chevys are very nice vehicles and worthy of your consideration, in case anybody from Chevys listening to the message today. But uh, reliability, reliability is an important factor for consumers, isn't it? J.D. Power, J.D. Power & Associates, it basically exists to tell you which products are worthy of your consideration. Uh, so that a cell phone company can sell their product with a slogan like, America's most reliable 5G network. Who knows what that is, by the way? Oh, it must not be that good of an advertisement then. I'm not going to tell you. All right. But people do. They want things that work. People want things that work, that they can trust, things they can depend on. Enter Psalm 118, verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. He's good. His steadfast love endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. If J.D. Power and Associates related, or rated I'm sorry, the reliability of the gods, well, they'd probably find a way to mess that up in some way, shape, or form. But if the, tr the scoring was truly accurate, they would find that there is only one true God. <laughs> they would find that he is holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy, infinitely reliable, dependable. They would find that he is entirely good, the essence of good, that everything he says and does is good. They would find that he is the only one worthy of our trust, our faith, our worship. 
Psalm 118 concludes a portion of the Psalms, uh, 113 through 118, which are called the Egyptian Hallel. The Egyptian Hallel. The word Hallel in the Hebrew language means praise. Praise. Uh, this is what we get the word Hallelujah from. The Hallel or the Hallelu is praise, and the Yah at the end refers to the revealed name of God, Yahweh. So that just means praise God, praise Yahweh. Um, so that's Hallel, but why would these psalms be called the Egyptian Hallel? Aren't these Israelites, we'd think? And they're called Egyptian because Israel would sing this and sing these psalms, 113 through 118, during the celebration of Passover. When, remember Passover, is when Israel was taking the time, as God commanded, to celebrate the original Passover, remembering God's work of redemption to bring them out of Egypt. So they're thinking back to God, redeeming them out of Egypt, and singing these psalms to commemorate it. And so when we read in the Gospels, think about this, when we read in the Gospels about Jesus and the disciples singing psalms together in the upper room at the Last Supper, which we just looked back towards there as we uh, participated in the Lord's Supper, when they sang those songs together, they would have been singing these psalms. They sung this there in the upper room. Uh, when Jesus was done teaching his disciples there, they, they sang, think about this, they were doing the Passover meal. Jesus shows them how it points to him. He inaugurates the Lord's Supper, which points to him, from that Passover meal. And then they sing these psalms, which point to him. How amazing is that? What a great night that was, right? It's also, uh, it is believed that this psalm was written in correlation with the rebuilding of the temple. Think after the exile, uh, when the Jews had been allowed to return to the promised land 70 years after the fall of Jerusalem to Babylon. Uh, in, in the psalms, in this psalm, we're going to see uh, a comparison then of what Israel was experiencing after the exile, after the return, and with that compared the redemption of Israel out of Egypt. Does that make sense? So we're going to see a parallel of Israel after the uh, redemption from Egypt and Israel after the return from Babylon, from Persia. Okay, that's the parallel uh, that we're going to see. This parallel is made most plain in verse 14 and the verses following. Go ahead and look down at verse 14 from Psalm 118 where it says, The Lord has become my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. So you see that in Psalm 118, 14. Now, hopefully you still have Exodus 15. I warned you about that before. Go back to Exodus 15. In this passage, as we're counting the response of Israel after God had parted the Red Sea, and the entire nation had crossed over on dry ground after, and after Pharaoh and the Egyptian army had perished when God closed the sea back up over them. I'll start reading in verse 1. Exodus 15, verse 1. It says, uh, Then Moses... And the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. And then look at verse 2. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. You see that? That is Psalm 118.14, or better said, Psalm 118.14 is Exodus 15.2. The psalmist took this phrase word for word and put it in Psalm 118. Uh, still there in Exodus 15. Look with me at, at verse 6. They continued singing, Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. Then go down to verses 11 and 12. It says, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders, you stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. The right hand referring to the strength of God doing what he had willed to do. Now go back to Psalm 118. Psalm 118, look at verses 15 and 16. This is right after the psalmist had quoted Exodus 15 two. Okay, he follows that up with this, verse 15. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. Remember, Israel had uh, lived in tents, tabernacles, throughout the wilderness time. 
He says then, the right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. So Israel's situations had changed many times over the years. Their faithfulness, theirs, had come and gone. But the Lord is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change his mind. There is no shadow of turning with him. He is wholly reliable. Great is his faithfulness. So we see these two parallels. The parallels might be Israel in this situation, Israel in that situation, but what wasn't different at all? The Lord and his way of working, okay? So with that all in mind, and knowing that this is uh, the last message in a series called Jesus in the Psalms, let's look now deeper into Psalm 118 and find the Lord's reliability on display and also see how that reliability continues to shine in Jesus Christ. Psalm 118, verse 1. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love, his covenanted faithful love, endures forever. Let Israel say, the people, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron, the priests, say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, anybody from around the world who knows and fears the Lord, who, who has put their faith in him, let them say, his steadfast love endures forever. It's kind of a fun thing. You might think of like a song being sung and somebody says, this section, that you in the back. That's kind of what's going on here in the beginning of the psalm, okay? Now in verse 5, the occasion for this testimony and call to praise. It says, out of my distress, I called on the Lord. I prayed, I, I cried out to the Lord. And what did he do? The Lord answered me and set me free. And what does this truth remind us of? Verse 6, he knows this. The Lord is on my side. That's good news. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? We might think of a similar encouragement from Romans 8.31. If God is for us, who can be against us? And the writer of Hebrews quoted this verse in Hebrews 13.6. I remember the book was written to Hebrew people in the first century A.D. who were deciding to believe in Christ as their Messiah. People who would probably have been sharply rebuked, intimidated, threatened by their communities, even their own families, to prevent them from following Jesus. To those Hebrew people, the writer of Hebrews reminds them of this verse from Psalm 118. If you are with Christ, the Lord is on your side. Verse 7. The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. Therefore, verse 8, it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes, not just any man, but even the powerful. And the question is, to whom do I turn for my security? To whom do you turn for your security, your safety, your rest, your comfort? Who do you need to know is good with you for you to feel comfortable and at rest? To whom do you turn to seek after peace of heart, peace of mind? And then we can say, to creation, a person just as weak as you and me, or to the creator, the almighty, all-powerful, all-reliable, all-loving God. Now, another question we might have uh, from these verses is this. What does it mean to take refuge in the Lord? What is that, to take refuge in him? Uh, in the Psalms, when we see this language, this designation, it, it's paired with the righteous. Uh, those who take refuge in the Lord are also considered the righteous. It's contrasted with the wicked, and it boils down to, then, those who believe, those who follow the Lord. And so we would call those who take refuge in the Lord those who are saved, those who have trusted in Christ for their salvation. It is those who love the Lord. It is those who fear the Lord and seek to follow him with their life. And the contrast, of course, would be those who take, 
do, who do not, I'm sorry, and the contrast, of course, would be that those who take refuge in the Lord are not seeking to take refuge in people. I stumbled over that. Does that make sense what I'm saying there? If you're not taking refuge in the Lord, that means you are taking refuge in something else, whatever that thing might be. If it's a confidence in myself, if it's a desire to be pleasing to this crowd of people, or to have that certain specific person uh, give approval, who am I taking refuge in? Uh, they're not finding their identity in the approval of man, if believers in Christ or not. They're not craving uh, the, the desires, the pressures of the world around them out of fear for not fitting in or fear of losing their lifestyle because they've trusted in the finished work of Christ on the cross for their sin. They're seeking to glorify God in everything they do. They're united with Christ and his people and identified with him. Okay? Verse 10. In verse 10, the psalmist continues to describe the perilous situation that he or, or all Israel was in. Verse 10. All nations surrounded me. And then here's some uh, good feedback here. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I cut them off. It's interesting, the Hebrew word there is the same word that's used for circumcision. But it's not that, okay? But that's why it says cut them off in the English. You might, you might think, what kind of, why that word? But basically what it could be translated as, or what we could think of it as, is I fended them off. I defeated them. <laughs> I pushed them away by the Lord's strength. Verse 11, they surrounded me. They surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. Verse 12, they surrounded me like bees, like a thick swarm of bees. So we're thinking big opponents, surrounded by opponents, getting into all the, like, a thick cloud of insects all invading everything. He's trying to get every base covered here. They surrounded me like bees. They went out, though, like a fire among thorns, a fire of dried out thorny branches. It ignites quickly, and it extinguishes just as fast. A big problem, gone. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation, my savior, my deliverer, my rescuer. Remember, this, this verse 14 is taken from Exodus 15 too. And the following verses recount what was sung by Israel in Exodus 15. After that first Passover, the first Passover in Egypt. Israel was surrounded then, after they left, by Egypt, chasing after them. Remember Pharaoh and his army chasing after Israel after he changed his mind again with a hard heart? And Israel could have looked back and seen all of the Egyptian army storming at them, all the dust flying up from the army coming at them, and they turn around and what was on the other side? The Red Sea. They felt surrounded, right? And the psalmist does as well. Uh, after writing Psalm 118, the Jews were to sing of their continued deliverance as they continued to celebrate the Passover. Remember, the deliverances looked different. Different times, different situations, different places, different nations, but the same reliable God every time. Uh, the song of verse 14 and, and the repeating of what Israel sang continues in verse 15. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. Remember, Israel had lived in those tents. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. And when the psalmist is feeling overwhelmed by the strong attacks or his enemies, or when we are feeling overwhelmed, we are right to recount. We are helped to remember the Lord is the strongest. The Lord is the one who will lift us up. Not the situation just going the way we want it to or hope that it will. Verse 17, I shall not die but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The purpose of continuing to live. God preserved his people to tell the world of his greatness. God preserves and builds the church to make disciples of all nations. Verse 18, the Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. It's amazing. All, all the trouble the psalmist has just endured, he, he, he saw as the providential allowance of the Lord. He sought as God's working in his life. The Lord allowed these enemies to discipline or to refine the psalmist, and it was used for his good. So in the midst of the trial, when it's happening, when there's an overwhelming feeling, there's a, a, a need of rescue, the psalmist 
cried out to the Lord for that rescue, and rightly so. So should we all. And then, though, after the trial was concluded, the psalmist praised the Lord for the trial. It's amazing, isn't it? In verse 19, uh, we shift into some uh, verses, some language that we may be more familiar with uh, from passages we've seen in the New Testament. So it's kind of a shift here to verse 19. There is a sense in which what the psalmist writes in the verses ahead would have been uh, fitting for the deliverance of their day, of their time, a deliverance they were certainly right to be thankful for, and the deliverance written of here has also a sense of finality, of full and final deliverance. And when you have full and final deliverance, when you have the realization of final victory, you have the Messiah. That only comes with him. And the people of Israel did take this passage to be messianic. They understood that, as we'll see in a little bit. So verse 19 says this, Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them, and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. Uh, These are gates of righteousness because... They are the gates of the kingdom whose God is the Lord, whose king, the king who enters through these gates, is righteous. And if the king is returning to the gates in this way, saying these things, declaring these things, he is returning in victory, which means this is a triumphal entry, a triumphal entry. Who could this king be? Verse 21. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. Uh, The king enters the gates of righteousness and victory, and all those who enter with him do so because he answered their cry for salvation. And then some of the verses that may sound familiar to you, starting in verse 22. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. I remember the psalmist has the building of the temple in his mind after the exile. He's thinking of this construction and the beauty of this new temple. And so this illustration is given. All the stones were lined up. They are prepared to be used for construction. And the builders did their inspections, and and they didn't think that this stone was the right shape. The stone is not the right size. It wasn't up to their standards to be a good starting point to build a good, strong building. But the stone that the builders rejected, in fact, was the only suitable cornerstone. The cornerstone. And understand, when they used the cornerstone in this way, it had to be straight. It had to be the right size. Everything that was built off of that from there was based on the dimensions of this stone. And so if that stone was wrong, the whole building would not be reliable. It'd be be faulty. Does that make sense? And so they had to pick the right one. So then beyond the illustration, of course, who is this referring to? We might look at this and and think of those other nations surrounding Israel or the the psalmist and think, uh, the builders must be the world, maybe, and the cornerstone is Israel. But... When we see a passage uh, like Isaiah 28, we look at a passage like Isaiah 28, which would have preceded the time of the writing of this psalm. And Isaiah 28 says this, and you can look it up in your, in your Bible if you'd like to, or I have some of these passages up on the screen. But Isaiah 28, starting in verse 11, says this, For by a people of strange lips and with a foreign tongue, that's not Israel. You understand that? That'd be kind of like us. For by people of strange lips and with a foreign tongue, the Lord will speak to this people, to whom he has said, This is rest. Give rest to the weary, and this is repose. Yet they would not hear. So so God is going to bring to himself, save a people from among the nations, and they will take refuge in the Lord when Israel largely has not. Verse 13. And the word of the Lord will be to them precept upon precept, Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. If that that sounds monotonous, it's supposed to. Here a little, there a little. That they may go and fall backward 
than be broken and snared and taken. And we, we, if, we, if we love studying the Word of God, we might think of that precept upon precept, line upon line, like, ooh, yeah, let's get into the Word, let's dig and let's study. But what this is actually saying is that people are going to stumble over the Word of God. They're going to see the law. They're going to they're understand what it all says, and it's going to repel them. Okay? The Word is going to become a snare to Israel. They'll stumble over the commands of God. Verse 14. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers, who rule this people in Jerusalem, because you have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with Sheol we have an agreement. When the overwhelming whip passes through, it, shall not, it will not come to pass, or it will not come to us, for we have made lies our refuge, and in falsehood we have taken shelter. Remember, Israel was in covenant with God, with Yahweh, the old covenant, through Moses, delivered in the time of the exodus in the wilderness, agreed to by the people. And so what God is saying here, though, is you've made a covenant with other gods. This is what you've done. Verse 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the Lord God, behold, I am the one who has laid as a foundation in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. Okay, so to summarize, God was going to lay a cornerstone, and it wasn't going to be the world necessarily that stumbled over that cornerstone. Israel was going to reject it, and people from among the nations would believe. And this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. That passage finished out. So God is building a temple from a cornerstone that would be largely rejected by Israel and believed on by people from around the world. So then, of course, to whose eyes is this cornerstone and temple construction beautiful? It's got to be beautiful to those who believe. To the Jews who believe, yes, and also to the Greek or to those from the other, all the other people groups around the world. Okay? So, of course, uh, we still need to answer the question, who is this cornerstone, though I think we know who that is, uh, but let's figure that out. For our scripture reading today, we read Matthew 21, 33 to 46, the parable of the tenants. And the parable, uh, the, there's parallel passages found in Mark 12 and Luke 20, the same parable. But in this parable of the tenants, Jesus speaks of a master who sends for fruit that should be growing in his land. And the tenants of the land continue to beat, to stone, to kill those who he sends. And eventually then, the master sends his own son course, as we read, the tenants have the son killed as well. They want the inheritance for themselves. And to that, Jesus states, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, meaning the Jewish leaders were the tenants. And Jesus is the son. And therefore, the Jewish leaders were the builders, and Jesus is the cornerstone. Uh, the apostle Peter affirms this in Acts 4. In Acts 4, uh, I'll, I'll read to you verses 1 through 12. It says, As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees, they came upon them, greatly annoyed, because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. That's a good day. Verse 5, on the next day their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name do you do this? And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. And then he says in verse 11, This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. Please hear that today. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. 
The Apostle Paul speaks to this in Ephesians chapter 2. I'll read uh, verses 11 through 22 here. And let's watch and listen for correlations with Isaiah 28 as well that I already read to you. So Ephesians 2 verse 11. Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles, that's us, in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision by the Jews, which is made in the flesh by hands. That's not a matter of faith, only if it was obedience by faith. It says in verse 12, Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. It says in verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Remember, keep in mind, as you read this, the temple the building of the temple that was in the mind of the psalmist in Psalm 118. And now what's Paul writing about? Verse 15, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in the place of the two, so making peace. So you have the Jewish people and you have the rest of the world called the Gentile world, which I would imagine most of us, if not all of us, are a part of that. And God is making from all of them one new man. Verse 16. And might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. (laughs) And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near, the Gentiles and the Jews. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Are there like second-class citizens in the people of God? No. We've been joined together as a people with, with Old Testament saints, New Testament saints. Verse 20. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So now, wait a minute. (laughs) We are definitely seeing that Jesus is the cornerstone of Psalm 118. That's for sure. That's kind of indisputable here. And the psalmist was thinking about the physical temple being built in his day. But what temple is Jesus the cornerstone for? What is that temple? And to that we should say, hey church, you are, you are the Old Testament saints and the new believing Israel and the church being built together the whole structure being joined together. So this this household of God, it doesn't necessarily point back to the temple. We're not a sign of the temple that was. The temple pointed forward to the household of God, the people of God united as the dwelling place for God. Does that make sense? So we have the picture of the cornerstone from back in Psalm 118, and you're supposed to look forward and see That's Jesus. And then you have the picture of the temple from Psalm 118, and you look forward and you say, that's us. That's us. And God is putting all of his people from all time who are redeemed by him uh, through the shed blood of Christ together as the dwelling place of God. Again, the Apostle Peter affirms this idea in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. Just four verses or five verses here. Okay, this will be a little quicker. As you come to him, it says, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. That was Christ. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture. Guess what Scripture we're about to see? Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. That's Isaiah 28 that we read earlier. 
Verse 7, so the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. That's Psalm 118. And verse 8, a stone of stumbling. Oh, I didn't forward it for you. There you go. Verse 18, and a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. That's Isaiah 8. Okay, they stumbled because they disobeyed the word as they were destined to do. Okay, so now, uh, living in the time that we do, with the rest of Scripture revealed, we have all of God's word. We get to see from Psalm 118, Christ is the cornerstone, we are the temple, and Christ is coming again in victory. Therefore, Psalm 118. Now we're going to finish Psalm 118, verse 24. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Does that help us to understand better the context of that verse? We've sung that song a bunch, right? This is the day that the Lord has made. That's what it's actually talking about. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. Save us, we pray in the Hebrew is Hosanna. That's where the word Hosanna comes from. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The reason, when we read about the triumphal entry, remember I talked about triumphal entry earlier? We think about the triumphal entry in the Gospels, Jesus coming in on the donkey and the, laying the, the palm leaves and, and covering the ground and the people shouting. They said, Ho- Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! The reason why they said it that way is because the gospel writers wrote out the Hebrew for us, save us, we pray, and it stuck. It continued to get transliterated into the English, the hos, it's Hoshiana, save us, we pray. They were just quoting Psalm 118. Uh, the people in Jerusalem were singing this psalm, thinking of the coming Messiah, and they were singing it concerning Jesus the week before Passover. A fitting preparation for the Passover lamb to go to the cross to pay the redemption, uh, for the redemption of his people in his first advent, his first coming. And a fitting dress rehearsal, a dress rehearsal, if you will, of Christ's second coming, when the final, true, triumphal entry will take place. Verse 27, the Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. This is the Aaronic blessing. Uh, It's been eternally fulfilled, by the way, in the coming of Christ. And so to the believing Israelite under the Old Covenant, they desired to celebrate and to look forward to that through sacrifice. They wanted to, and so it says, bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. They wanted to go worship and offer sacrifices. And then the final two verses, and we'll be done. Almost. Okay, verse 28. You are my God. I promise it's the last page. You are my God, and I will, ex- I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Let's worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Our reliable, dependable, steadfast, faithful God redeemed his people from Egypt, redeemed his people from Babylonian exile, redeems his people from their sin, from our sin. Our reliable God, think about this, used an unlikely savior in Joseph who was sold into slavery but became second in command in Egypt. He used Joseph to redeem his people. He used an unlikely leader in Moses who grew up Egyptian royalty but gave him uh, his position to identify. He gave it up to identify with the Lord and with the people of God. Moses left all that he could have had in Egypt to lead Israel. He used an unlikely king in, in David, the youngest in his family, a shepherd boy, uh, but who had a heart after God's own heart. And he used Jesus. Did you hear this? Different times, different people, different situations, the same God doing things his reliable way. He used Jesus of Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? To live a sinless life, to go to the cross, to take our sin on himself, taking God's wrath for our sin on himself so that we could be rescued, redeemed, saved, set apart to God. And our reliable God has promised in his steadfast covenant faithfulness to take all those who believe in him, who take refuge in him through Christ, and to make us his dwelling place. The culmination of that is Revelation 21. I'll just read this to you. Verses 1 through 5. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, 
For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. The sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Write this down to John, for these words are trustworthy. They're reliable and true. Christian, we serve a reliable God, a trustworthy, faithful God. And as we think forward to 1 Peter, it will start next week. Be encouraged to know we can have a living hope that fuels us, equips us, urges us, pushes us, a living hope to follow God in this perishing world. We are the people of God. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for your trustworthiness. We thank you that you are good, that everything you say and do is good, that you are righteous, everything you say and do is righteous. Lord, we thank you that you are just, that there will be no uh, righteousness left unrewarded, there will be no sin left unpunished. Lord, we thank you that you are also gracious and loving toward us to know that every sin of ours has been already completely punished, your wrath fully poured out through the sacrifice of Jesus. I do pray again, Lord, if there's anyone here today who's never put their faith and trust in Jesus, Lord, may today be the day of their salvation, that they would cry out to you, confess their sin, believe in you, and call on you for their rescue, for their salvation. Lord, we thank you that all, we know that the word of God says that all who will, will be saved. And then God, help us to continue to grow. Uh, a lot of what we talk about this morning was kind of a big picture of, of your work and what you're doing, where we fit into the, the grand narrative of scripture. And I pray that you would help us uh, to, to process that. I pray that the spirit would work in our hearts to be able to process more of who you are and who we are and what you're doing uh, that we would then be able to see our place and then rightly live before you, to go from here with a better sense of our identity in Christ, uh, that it would give us a confidence, uh, an assurance of what you're going to do and, and who we are in Christ so that we can follow you with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. Oh, God, bless us in this way. Use us in this way. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.